Thank you very much, Kovaris, for inviting me to come speak to you today. And I'm going to talk to you about a scalable FFP sample prep method that we are implementing into our clinical LCMS assays. So I'm coming from Memorial Sloan Kettering. And so we're a cancer treatment and research institute. And we're the largest and oldest private cancer center in the world. And we are comprised of Memorial Hospital, which was originally New York Cancer Hospital, and Sloan Kettering Institute. And those two institutions merged in 1980. And so I'm a member of the actual hospital, and I am the director of the Clinical Proteomics Laboratory. So our laboratory is part of the hematopathology service within the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. Um, and until a few months ago, we were just the Department of Pathology, but we have merged. Um, so I look at this within a perspective of pathology and pathological diagnosis. And we are regulated by New York State Department of Health. We are a CLIA lab, uh, so we are very highly regulated, have to follow a lot of standards. Uh, and all of our technologists have to be licensed by New York State, which means a lot of them are coming from a clinical laboratory training background, but do not have mass spectrometry experience and not proteomics experience. So that's why I think this will show you that this type of workflow will work really well in an environment where you're not necessarily specialized either. So here I just show you our QX active, um, our laser microdissection, LMD 6500. I won't talk about microdissected specimen today, but we um, utilize microdissection um, in our assays. And then we have an LE220 RSC from Covaris. And all of the work I'm showing here has been done on this system. So um, when you think about pathology and you think about what pathologists are doing and how diagnosis is being formed, you probably primarily think about microscopy. But in reality, modern pathology departments and diagnosis that is occurring in these departments is more complicated. Pathologists are looking at microscopy, they're looking at morphology, they're identifying cell types, things like that, but there's also cytogenetics, especially in a cancer hospital, we're looking at chromosomal abnormalities, flow cytometry to identify unique cell populations and abnormal cell populations in molecular pathologies. We're talking about next generation sequencing, looking for mutations that help further refine the diagnosis or subtype of disease, especially in things like lymphoma and leukemia. Um, and then this is just an example here, sorry, there's a laser. Um, of clonality testing on um, lymphomas. So what we are trying to do is look at how pathology already incorporates these advanced technologies in diagnosis and World Health Organization and other um, bodies already uh, require some of these advanced diagnosis um, things such as molecular pathology for gold standard diagnosis. And what we wanna do is take mass spectrometry-based proteomics and move it into that world. And so utilizing patient specimen, that um, standard patient specimen, um, FFP tissue primarily, fresh frozen occasionally, serum, blood, uh, and then cells coming from bone marrow biopsy, CSF, et cetera. And what we are working really focused on is pre-analytical processing of these samples so that they are amenable for LCMS analysis. And then, of course, the development of the actual assays using the instrumentation and how to generate that data that is going to mean something to our pathologists and clinical, clinician colleagues. So today, I really am going to just talk about how we're utilizing the Covaris system uh, for processing and preparation of our FFP tissue samples. So if you've worked with FFP tissue or you want to work with FFP tissue, you're probably quite aware of the fact that the tissue goes through a whole lot of processing um, and we have to think about all of that processing when we want to go backwards and extract out the protein. Um, so one of the benefits of being part of the pathology department is that I have been allowed to go into the labs and see all of the different parts of the processing. but just briefly, tissue specimens get grossed, they get fixed, dehydrated, embedded, um, and then cutting, staining, and then review. So we kind of take the sample somewhere around here um, and process them from there. <laughs> 
So about five years ago, um, we did our first validation on a clinical assay, and that's from FFP tissue. And this is the protocol that we have been following since then on this um, sample prep, and that um, we optimized at that time. So we start with a two-step heating um, for reversing of cross-linking. All of this is done in 0.5 mil tubes. We use a bath sonicator, um, and so the tubes are floating around in there. Uh, we do reduction alkylation, and then an overnight trypsin digestion, C18. So we're doing all this on a thermomixer and tubes, so we're limited to about 24 samples per thermomixer. Total time, about 16 to 24 hours, because depending upon how early we are in and moving forward with C18 cleanup. So when you think about a clinical timeline and turnaround time, this is not really gonna work because pathologists and clinicians are waiting for answers. And if we're gonna, if an immunohistochemistry is gonna be come out the next morning and we're taking three or more days, um, that's not gonna be very helpful. So what we wanted to do is take this sample prep and put it onto our Kovaris LA220 system. Uh, so the first step of that um, process is to take and transfer our sauna, this homogenization step onto um, the, into the AFA. So we, um, instead of doing, we have the same heating step, uh, but instead of doing 30 minutes in the bath sonicator, we have two steps of AFA. Um, and so this is using a TPX 96 well plate. Um, and this is, so if we do one row, it's 5.5 minutes of sonication on each side. Um, and a whole plate you can do in 66 minutes. So it's 96 samples. So we did direct comparison of just the homogenization where we left everything else the same. Uh, and if we look at total protein extraction, so this is using a healthy spleen sample and like uh, we just take a six micron section and we look at total protein extracted based on a BCA assay. Uh, and this is in, we use a zwitterionic uh, buffer. This is what we originally validated. Um, so we just wanted to do a direct transfer keeping buffer system the same. Uh, and then if we look at, we run, we normalize and run the same amount of the sample um, on, by LCMS on our Q Exactive. Um, and we see that protein groups and peptide groups, um, unique protein and peptide groups identified in the f these replicates are pretty similar, maybe slightly lower when you look at the AFA. Uh, but we did then look at what proteins are identified in at least three out of four replicates of any condition. And when you look at that and take out that um, stochastic effect, that then you have pretty high overlap. So basically what I'm saying is that we're extracting the same amount of protein using either method. Um, and then our protein profile that we get from this sample that we've extracted is very much the same. And we also specifically look at certain protein groups that we're more interested in. And so one group of proteins that we pulled out and looked at um, log two abundance is what I'm showing here. And this is just from within Proteum Discover doing label-free quantitation, pretty like um, uncomplicated analysis. And we looked at immunoglobulin subtypes. So these are constant regions. So it's pretty similar between um, the two methods there. So we did some initial, I'm not gonna bore you with all of that, but we did some initial optimization of our specific homogenization to further improve the protein extraction. And once we were happy with that, then um, after some additional optimization of shortening our heating um, and shortening our reduction alkylation time, we moved on to what is our real bottleneck, and that is our digestion. So doing overnight trips and digestion is going to obviously not allow you to get your samples onto the instrument in the same day. So we wanted to move that step onto the, with, onto the Kavaris with the AFA um, and do trips and digest with AFA. Uh, and so in this case, we again are using a healthy spleen sample, same buffer system. In this case, all samples are in the TPX plate because they're all going on to, um, the whole workflow is in that 96 well plate format. Um, so we compared overnight digestion at 37 degrees 
and we compare, and then three hours at 37 degrees on the thermomixer, and an hour of AFA digestion in three hours. And so we looked at, focused on, um, you, I'm not showing, but protein group identification, all of that, when we analyzed it by mass spectrometry, was very similar. And so we focused in on miscleavage. And so we see that um, with the overnight digestion, the lowest amount of miscleavage, but three hour digestion on the AFA um, is maybe a couple percent more miscleavage. So we're talking about less than 10% miscleavage um, when we do digestion with three hours of AFA. Um, and then we spike into our samples a digestion standard from Promise Proteomics called Digestif. It's a uh, heavy isotope labeled. And so we have this tail here where it has varying degrees of difficult, uh, difficulty triptych cleavage sites. And um, this is just showing older data when we first started using this and we did a, some time points. So I'm just showing some of the time points from that and where we tried to see what miscleavages are we most likely to see if we have any digestion issues. Uh, this last pair here of the miscleaved peptide and the full cleavage are the ones, but we target um, the set in all of our samples to evaluate any kind of trips and digestion issues. And that's true of all clinical samples. Um, so if we catch any issues before analysis or during analysis. So this is just showing the percent of that peptide that is um, miscleavage product versus fully cleaved. And so in the overnight and the three hour AFA, we don't detect um, or any miscleavage product of that pair is below our limit of detection. So we feel like our digestion efficiency is comparable between overnight at 37 degrees and three hours on AFA. So what we were able to do is take a workflow that we were having run overnight um, and now fit that into like a seven to eight hour workflow uh, and able to go from something that was limited to um, 24 samples roughly. We could do multiple thermomixers, but then you're also dealing with like, a, like 48 tubes you're opening and closing all the time. Uh, now we do this on a TPX plate all the way through. We put the samples in here and they come out once we get to C18 cleanup. Uh, so now we can scale up to 96 samples. Um, and so the AFA has facilitated a workflow that's allowing us, sorry, to do homogenization um, through digestion and able to do this in a single well. So we're not transferring the samples at any point. Uh, and then also this would be compatible with automation. We don't have automation at this time, but um, that is best to kind of develop these methods so we can move it to that. And so we have this high throughput workflow. And we can use this workflow. Some tests we have are low volume. And then we have other tests that were in the process of approval or validation that might be very high volume. So we can use the same workflow, the same processing for a wide variety of sample numbers. So I'm just gonna show you how we've implementing this into an assay that we've already validated and we're working through getting approval for. So um, plasma cell neoplasms are diseases which um, abnormal plasma cells form tumors in the bones. And multiple myeloma is the most common form of plasma cell neoplasm. And plasma cells, if you don't know, are your white cells that are producing antibodies uh, to fight against infection. And sorry, the um, neoplastic plasma cells accumulate in their bone marrow and they displace your healthy cells. And that neoplastic um, clone just keeps replicating. It's producing a monoclonal antibody and most are producing, and they're producing a monoclonal antibody and most are secreting high levels of that monoclonal antibody. And so diagnosis of a plasma cell neoplasm requires the identification of a neoplastic monoclonal um, cell population by microscopic evaluation of the biopsy and then characterization of that monoclonal immunoglobulin usually by immunohistochemistry, so antibody-based detection on the biopsy is shown here. Um, or in situ hybridization. And so the immunohistochemistry assays for immunoglobulins uh, tend to have very high background staining because they have some issues with specificity. They're using polyclonal antibodies in many cases. And also these assays aren't standardized um, and they're very difficult to qu make quantitative. So what we wanted to do is to develop a targeted mass spectrometry assay 
that allow us to determine from the tissue the relative quantitation of immunoglobulin heavy and light chains so that we can characterize the immunoglobulin in the tissue, um, especially when some of the immunohistochemistry is difficult to read. So we just developed a um, parallel reaction monitoring uh, assay where we looked at the theoretical digest of those proteins, right? We looked at what proteins were unique. We um, used purified immunoglobulins of different subtypes to do test experiments and finalized our list of peptides and ordered stable isotope labeled peptides. And then we did all of our LOD, LOQ, uh, rep reproducibility studies, et cetera, and ended up with our um, table here showing all of the peptides that are part of the targeted assay as well as their limit of detection and limit of quantitation and femtomoles. And so we process our FFP bone marrow needle biopsy, which is quite a small um, biopsy, and we take one section at six microns of that and process it. We spike in these heavy isotope labeled peptides, run that in a scheduled PRM method on the QX active, and then we analyze in Skyline. And so we look at relative, we look at relative abundance of these different heavy chain subtypes, um, the light chain, and then also immunoglobulin gamma subtypes. Um, not relevant to the, so much the plasma cell neoplasms, but some other diseases that we're also uh, validating for. So when we did this validation, we're comparing the results to immunohistochemistry uh, results, because these are all cases that have been uh, diagnosed and um, results signed out. So for example, in this case, we see that it's um, the light chain is lambda, which matches with what the immunohistochemistry is. So after we have our results, we compare that. And then also we compare to serum studies, which are always done on multiple myeloma patients, where they look to identify if there's a monoclonal immunoglobulin circulating. They determine the subtype by immunofixation, uh, which determines that's IgG uh, lambda. And then we look at free light chain levels. These are all used in the diagnosis and um, characterization of that monoclonal antibody. And we compare that to what we are able to do by mass spectrometry, because these should be the same monoclonal antibody. Um, and so we can see that those align, the serum studies align with what we are seeing from our uh, tissue analysis. So we had a validation set of 44 FFP samples. This work was done prior to us fully um, optimizing our FFP method on our LE220 RSC, but we took a subset of those samples and processed them um, following this workflow. Um, and so this is hard to see, but we'll show one. Uh, so we did 15 cases plus a myometrium um, negative control. Um, and all the results were concordant, meaning that what we would call that um, immunoglobulin subtypes um, matches with between the two sample preps and that the results were the same regardless of which way we processed our tissue. Uh, so this is just one example of a case where there was a woman who um, came in with um, spinal cord compression with concern for multiple myeloma. Bone marrow biopsy shows a high involvement of CD1, uh, of neoplastic plasma cell um, population, and it's lambda light chain restricted. Um, and we see that on the left is when we did our initial validation, and on the right is the um, relative uh, percentage of the subtypes based on um, the sample prepped using our um, improved workflow. So the results are concordant to, to regardless of which way we process a sample. So we did all of our validation prepping our sample one way, and then we switched it to our high throughput um, method, which will really increase the throughput possibility of this assay, which is expected to be quite high, decreases the turnaround time, making it possible for FFP-based proteomics to fit within a true clinical setting and expectation. I just want to show that we also utilize the um, LE220 RSC for a lot of different sample prep types. Uh, and so we have moved, oops, there we go. We've developed our cell lysis workflow as well on the system using the TPX96 well plate, including this is an SDS-based buffer for this example. So we are using SP3 cleanup and doing our digestion on bead in the system as well. I'm not gonna show any data about that, but I just wanted to, to mention that because we are trying to use this for a lot of different sample preps. Um, and so this is allowing us to do diverse sample prep in a um, short turnaround time with high throughput. 
So I want to just thank my colleagues in hematopathology at MSK, um, Cooper, in technologist in the lab, who him and I did most of these experiments together, um, the surgical pathology laboratory, which allows me, like I said, to come in and ask all kinds of weird random questions and to help me get materials um, as needed. And then um, my colleagues at Covaris who worked with me on this. And of course, the family, um, Farmer Family Foundation who funds our protein diagnostic development. And there's a poster with a lot more details and data about the FFP development steps uh, later today. And if anyone has any questions. Good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, so first and foremost, thanks um, for your participation in uh, one of today's breakfast workshops um, organized by ASMS and led by the Covaris team. Um, yeah, so today I wanted to basically discuss the use of uh, the AFA technology um, that Jessica just um, pointed out on uh, the development of a robust cell-based high-throughput protein extraction workflow. In this presentation, um, I'll be talking a little bit about the study rationale and some background context of our work, and uh, follow this up with our proposed cell-based high-throughput protein extraction protocol, um, and then basically discuss uh, some of the optimization experiments that we carried out to establish um, our model. Um, and then I will cover the uh, protein coverage analysis I did, um, and then briefly discuss some of the subsequent approaches um, moving forward. And of course, finally, um, a very short summary of our findings. So the rationale behind this study actually stems from the emergence of precision medicine that uh, is really the primary focus of uh, Jenny Van Eyck's lab at Cedar sinai that I'm part of. And we basically primarily focus on disease prevention. Um, but precision medicine can also aid in the treatment and therapy when considering the variability in genes of individuals with, with respect to their environment and lifestyle. So one way that uh, we could actually address this is through proteomics, where a disease risk can be determined based on the quantification of an individual's protein. And then, of course, to be able to accurately quantify these proteins, um, and uh, basically propose putative mechanisms for discovery purposes and generate relevant clinical data, um, there is definitely a need for an established high throughput cell-based screening system. So basically such a workflow um, can enable the rapid ident identification of biomarkers um, that, uh, you know, more importantly provide an individualized based treatment regimen for each affected patient. And that is really the focus here. Um, now, given our work uh, being primarily focused on the protein of heart, we actually went about uh, to develop a simplified, scalable, and automated high-throughput-based workflow where our bottom-up proteomics pipeline uh, did direct the processing of cardiomyocytes in a 96 volt protein assay uh, for LCMS analysis. And uh, this basically system um, will eventually be able to um, address many of the cellular perturbations um, and cardiovascular related diseases moving forward. Now, typically a sample prep uh, workflow, um, as Jessica mentioned, involves um, quite a few stages. So for sample preparation, uh, you know, it involves uh, denaturation and lysis, which we typically use SDS, um, and that you follow it up with uh, cyst reduction and alkylation, followed by digestion, and at the end, uh, a desalting step. Um, and then you basically process the data. Uh, we tend to use uh, data independent acquisition for our processing of samples. And we also have uh, uh, an in-house uh, bioinformatics uh, tool uh, uh, that basically utilizes a swath pipeline for feature extraction, um, pipe profit for feature alignment, and of course, some elements of the skyline for quality control. And that brings uh, us to analysis, uh, you know, for protein inference using the MS2 spectra, and for stats analysis, um, false discovery change, fold change, and then you get to the visualizations, which are multiple web-based tools that you can use in order to aid the visualization, such as principal component, component analysis, heat maps, and at the end, um, you know, you also have protein protein interaction softwares, and uh, we actually use another in-house. Um, uh, bioinformatics uh, tool. It's called Pine. 
and uh, it's uh, an abbreviation from uh, Protein uh, Interaction Network uh, Extraction. Um, so I have a slide that I will go at the end of the presentation talk. So in this proposed workflow, um, cardiomyocytes are seeded and passaged for three days, uh, after which cells are metabolically labeled or grown in the presence of drugs prior to sample prep, and then approximately 100,000 cells are detached and transferred to the Covaris 96-volt um, plate and sonicated under optimized conditions. Then you have the denatured and lye cells, uh, which are then subjected to the S-strap sample processing on the Beckman I-7 workstation, um, and after which the peptides um, are loaded onto the LC column and acquired by DIA using um, the thermal lumos micro uh, system. So this brings me to the optimization experiments. Um, so since the hypothesis of this project revolved around cardiac perturbations, the assays involved human cardiomyocytes. Now, there is a lot of challenges uh, of assaying primary cells directly from tissues as a result of fragility. Um, so what we did was uh, we selected AC16 cells uh, uh, for the high throughput cell-based assays. Now, um, bottom left, uh, as you can see over here, is a um, schematic representation for the generation of the human cardiomyocyte cell line. There is essentially a fusion between primary cells from adult human ventricular heart tissue um, and the SV40 uh, transport human fibroblasts. Now, uh, so we did some um, experiments to, uh, to confirm <laughs> uh, uh, whether we get the molecular markers, and you can see that um, it does express most of the primary cardi cardiomyocyte markers uh, from the table, and when we basically compare this to um, another cell line, the kidney HEC293 um, T cells, it shows good expression of alpha and beta MHC as well as GATA A4 genetic markers. So we first went about optimizing the cell densities uh, because we had no clue, um, you know, how much cells to use for the uh, for the workflow. So what we did was, um, uh, so we went to optimize the cell densities uh, in order to assess the minimal amount of uh, basically total protein required to result in enough peptides for downstream LCMS analysis. Now, as expected, um, a higher pro um, total protein yield correlated with. Um, uh, samples containing high cell densities. However, it was interesting to note that at least 100,000 cells was required uh, in order to obtain at least one microgram per microliter for approximately 20 microgram of total protein, which is actually what we load in each uh, well of the Covaris plate for a high through uh, uh, workflow. And uh, that basically results to about seven microgram of peptides after desalting on the S-strap uh, for loading onto the LC column. Now, we then went about uh, sort of determining the suitability of different buffers in our high throughput protein extraction protocol. And uh, so we tested a wide range of, I guess, different types of buffers, including STS, super buffer, MP40, and urea, uh, in order to really see which buffer is the best. And um, as you can clearly see, the cell slides in SDS resulted in the highest protein concentration, where approximately one microgram per microliter of protein was yielded. So when you look at the, uh, the numbers of proteins, you can actually see that there were 4,366 uh, IDs detected upon the cell slides in SDS. And this was higher than the next buffer being the NP40 with approximately 4,000 proteins, which was uh, pretty good. Now, to assess the precision of each replicate in each buffer, we compared the number of detected IDs and observed the uniform distribution um, across all of the replicates. Um, and that was uh, very reproducible. Um, so we then um, uh, analyzed that on uh, the coefficient of variation um, analysis. And when you look at these CVs, uh, it was not out of the ordinary to find that the cells, lies, and SDS also resulted in the least number of dispersed proteins, um, where more than 66% of the IDs had CVs less than or equal to 25%. We then confirmed this on a principal component analysis 2D graph to see if the IDs matched a positive correlation. And uh, as expected, proteins were highly co uh, correlated in the SDS, uh, highlighted in blue, and nicely clustered on the lower right quadrant. Um, this was, however, not the case with the other two buffers, being the NP40 and urea highlighted in red and green, as you can see over there. But that just shows that um, uh, you know, because of the high dispersion, they signify different correla correlations amongst their detected protein IDs. We then looked at the number of quantified peptides to see the correlation with the protein identifications and observed 2,939 
uh, peptides that matched uh, 394 unique proteins from cells lysed in SDS. So this slide shows the dynamic range of uh, proteins in the different buffers, ranked uh, against the corresponding median uh, mass spec intensities. Now, um, I looked at the uh, curve and I wanted to see what proportion of the proteins were highly abundant and lowly abundant. So uh, in order to uh, basically determine this uh, representation, um, I actually constructed a trend line based on a polynomial best of fit to match the multilateral distribution of the data set. Now, as you can see over here, the, um, uh, for the SDS highlighted in yellow, in addition to providing a better protein coverage, it also depicted more of the lowly abundant proteins um, on the far right, uh, based on the median intensities compared to the other two buffers. Now, in the case of NP40 and urea highlighted in green and pink, um, both, of, uh, both the protein coverage and the ability of detecting the lowly abundant proteins were quite similar. So after determining the most suitable buffer, we optimize protein digestion. Um, and after selecting trypsin to be the preferred choice of enzyme, we went about optimizing the required amount in our protein extraction uh, model. Now, when you look at the uh, data, an increase in the amount of trypsin resulted in a higher number of uh, identified proteins. Though beyond 1 to 20 trypsin to sample ratio, the number of IDs actually started to decrease across the biological replicates. So then we assess the variability uh, um, on the uh, coefficient of variation um, chart, as you can see, um, that an increase in trypsin concentration actually corresponded to a higher number of proteins falling within 25% CV. And this was observed across the other samples in the data set as well. On the Venn diagram, however, there was an increase in the number of uh, unique proteins uh, in the 1 to 10 uh, trypsin um, ratio samples compared to the less concentrated ones, even though the total IDs were lower as shown from the bar chart. Now, on the PCA, however, lower trypsin, um, uh, lower trypsin concentration actually favored uh, the data clustering with a more positive correlation, despite having the lowest CV values. Yeah, so based on the data, we opted to use the 1 to 20 uh, trypsin to sample ratio as our preferred concentration moving forward for digesting the proteins in our um, protocol. Um, so we then tested our workflow on two different mass spectrometric instruments at different acquisition gradients. So we used the thermal orbital fusion LUMOS instrument, which we ran our samples at 60 minute gradient, as well as the uh, thermal orbital exposed 480 that a 45 minute gradient was utilized. Now, when we assessed the protein coverage from the LUMOS micro instrument, there were at least 4,200 unique proteins that were detected in each biological replicate, which was quite significant. And however, on the explorers, there were half of the number of IDs. Now that could be explained by the shorter acquisition gradient. Um, and when we look at the uh, Venn diagram, 86% of the unique proteins uh, from the LUMOS uh, 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 workflow um, were shared across the uh, biological replicates and only about 1% of the proteins unique in each replicate, which really showed reproducibility. Now samples processed with the explorers, um, however, um, did show similar uh, reproducibility, um, with all four uh, showing comparable number of IDs between uh, the, de um, well, detected at approximately 61% um, and the unique ones being around 3% in each of the four rep replicates. Um, so we then went to look at the CVs, um, and you can see that more than 60%, six, uh, more, more than 64% of the proteins from the LUMOS micro display the CV between 0 to 25%. Again, this was half on the Explorers uh, 480. Now, um, on the protein dynamic range um, on the LUMOS pipeline, you can see 995 proteins that uh, corresponded to about 22% that fell within the perfect correlation of the polynomial best fit trend line, and that signified the common proteins with um, median intensities. Um, now, most of the proteins detected through this pipeline involved highly abundant um, uh, at about 1,800. That approximately corresponded to 40%. Um, and that there were 15% uh, being detected as lowly abundant, coming to about 686. Now, when we uh, basically compared that, that to the Explorers 480, um, we actually saw that there were 20% more common proteins being detected in this, in this system, um, but there were less, uh, uh, less of the lowly abundant proteins. But similar to the LUMOS, uh, most of the proteins in this pipeline also uh, corresponded to highly abundant um, proteins.
Now, based on the collected data and, anal and analyzed results, we propose two workflows. First, a deep uh, protein coverage where the peptide load and extended acquisition gradient were not the limiting factors. And for this, we suggest the use of the thermal uh, Lumos micro system. And secondly, a medium uh, protein coverage uh, where the peptide loads was the limiting factor and long acquisition time was not required. And for this, uh, of course, we recommended Explorers 480. So to summarize, um, this slide, the Lumos Micro does result in the greatest number of detected proteins coming to about 4,200, though you do have to inject four micrograms of uh, peptides, which is quite, quite a lot. Um, you now the Explorers, uh, however, did result in quite a significant amount, well, number of IDs coming to about 2,300, though with the added advantage of uh, being able to get that many IDs with only 130 nanograms, which I thought was uh, very exciting. So for extensive analysis, uh, you know, you could use the micro as a good choice for detecting proteins over a 60-minute gradient and perhaps more significantly over a 120-minute gradient for deeper protein coverage uh, and use the uh, Explorers when you, you know, you're running assays that basically you don't get a lot of uh, cells and proteins and you want to opt for a workflow where you get enough peptides to be able to do some assays so you can get away with uh, loading uh, less peptides. Um, and now when I constructed the Venn diagram and compared the two, um, you know, there were still 35% of proteins that were shared between the two pipelines as well as 439 proteins unique to only the explorers. Um, so that uh, basically prompted me to look at both common and unique proteins in each of the pipelines. Now on the left, uh, you can actually see the Lumos micro pipeline um, in highlighted in blue, superimposed onto the green, which is the explorers. And on the um, right, you can see the, uh, you know, it, uh, you can see that the explorers appearing better equipped at detecting highly uh, as well as lowly abundant proteins compared to the Lumos micro, which was very, interesting for me because I would have thought uh, the, uh, the, the, the Lumos would be more equipped. Uh, that just shows uh, increasing the acquisition gradient doesn't necessarily increase the threshold level of detecting these peptides. Um, so then uh, we looked at the uh, unique proteins from each of the pipelines and uh, well I mean as expected you would get more unique peptides from the Lumos because of the longer acquisition gradient but what, what was interesting was on the Explorers you actually get um, a diverse range of proteins with different uh, median intensities. Uh, so that was pretty interesting to observe. So then we wanted to map the proteins to look at the workflow from a biological perspective and to really examine the system to assess some of the key pathways uh, for our other projects. Now here you can see the overrepresentation um, analysis that compared the proteins from two different pathways, KIG and Wiki, uh, using enrichment ratio and an FDR value of 5%. So both of these uh, databases resulted in uh, enriched pathways involving mitochondrial proteins, which was the primary focus on uh, another project of mine. And uh, you can see uh, the mitochondrial proteins involved in oxidative phosphorylation on the left, uh, depicted in the volcano uh, plot, as well as the uh, electron transport chain in the, uh, on the right in the bar chart. So from the keg, um, a total number of 2,223 proteins were mapped and uh, 78 of the 133 mitochondrial proteins were associated with the pathway. Um, and this was similarly seen in the uh, electron transport chain where 2,078 proteins were mapped and, uh, and uh, 46 of the 70 mitochondrial proteins were associated with it. And this brings me to the uh, next slide, which is to assess the subcellular localization of these proteins. Uh, in the assay in the mitochondria. So what we did was we actually compared it with uh, a bunch of other buffers. So TLB, which is a tissue lysis buffer from Covaris, another SDS-based one. Um, we have PEBDF, which stands for protein extraction buffer uh, detergent free. And of course, AMBIC, which is just an uh, ammonium bicarbonate. And you can see that the SDS, uh, you know, did result in the highest number of mitochondrial proteins coming to around 680. So that was uh, good to see as well. So I talked a lot about the SDS-based workflow, and I just wanted to uh, share the next couple of slides on um, uh, non-SDS-based uh, workflow. And uh, so despite the optimizations and established workflow, um, 
these non-SDS detectors did offer some important insights that we are currently investigating. Uh, so for example, when you look at the gene ontology annotations, you can actually see that the cell slice in NP40 highlighted in yellow actually does result in quite a deeper protein, uh, encompassing proteins that are involved um, in additional molecular as well as biological uh, functions and pathways. So despite resulting in a lower abundance of proteins compared to the SDS-based samples as previously shown, it is worth exploring to identify important classes of proteins or pathways that may or may not be involved in uh, a disease. Now, just to, to further elaborate this, we plotted the proteins that were unique to samples lies solely in NP40 and urea uh, that were absent uh, from the SDS in order to assess the extent of the protein coverage from these two buffers. Now, uh, the unique proteins of each of the two buffers um, are highlighted in these boxes and the ones uh, associated in the mitochondria in red. Uh, so you can still see that you do get uh, challenging proteins like the mitochondrial-based ones uh, from these two buffers. That really demonstrates the added diversity of, of identification in non-SDS buffers used in the Covaris system. Um, so as an extension to this discussion, I will now present a slide that really represents the importance of the Covaris integrated platform in our cell-based protein extraction workflow. Um, and that is the use of PINE, as previously mentioned. Now, um, you can see that the uh, uh, membrane-bound proteins are detected and associated with different biological functions um, that I basically <laughs> detected on this software. And uh, you can see the upregulated proteins representing differentially expressed uh, proteins um, in red and the ones downregulated in blue. Now, uh, as clearly demonstrated, most of the upregulated proteins involved with all of these processes are involved in the membrane um, associated biological processes with only a few downregulated ones. Um, furthermore, there are more upregulated proteins with greater fold change values, uh, so the ones that are much more dense. Um, and this really shows how well we can detect and characterize challenging proteins using this uh, Covaris uh, system, um, such as membrane-bound and mitochondrial proteins, in order to then um, uh, be able to perform rapid and robust high-throughput analysis on large cohort of studies with cellular perturbations, which is really what uh, our group at Cedars-Sinai are uh, targeting. Um, I'll now share some concluding remarks and take-home messages. Um, so we have uh, developed a cell-based high-throughput workflow for human cardiomyocytes using the Covaris AFA technology, uh, where protein extraction was optimized and achieved with different buffer system. And we are currently in the process of developing a simplified detergent-free workflow with AFA technology that requires no purification, as well as investigating um, this AFA technology for both extraction and trips and digestion. And uh, we hope uh, in the next six months or so, <laughs> Uh, you know, to be able to adapt this for both label-free as well as stable isotope labeling workflows, such as uh, TMT and AHA labeling, um, as well as being employed um, to be able to identify key regulators uh, in cell-based assays uh, involving uh, uh, post post-translational modifications, um, and you know, eventually uh, allow for rapid investigation for drug targets and cellular perturbations. Um, yeah, so with that said, i uh, like to thank our collaborator, the Covaris team, with their support and feedback in this project, um, uh, especially Samir and Eugenio for their technical expertise, as well as Deb for kindly allowing me to present at this uh, breakfast workshop. And uh, from our group, I'd like to thank Alejandro for sample prep, as well as Simeon, Ali, and Matt on the MS. And i also like to thank Blontin and other members of the Van Eyck Lab um, for their support as well as you guys for listening through this short presentation talk. Um, thank you very much, and if you have any questions.